We've never met. This is the first time we've ever met. Yeah. We just had lunch right before yeah, so this nice. thing started. I'm really glad that you came. You're coming from New Haven, right? So you live over there? Yes, in New Haven, still uh, stuck at Yale, <laughs> although I, I'm finished with school for the last 10 years or so. So I'm, I'm actually kind of a little confused myself because I know you went to Yale. Aren't you at CUNY right now or did you finish at CUNY? Technically, okay. I've been lingering as an okay. ABD candidate okay. for eight years or so been super busy writing music and it's just so hard to find time to write the dissertation but i'm very close at this point so it's okay. almost done and you study with tanya, tanya leon right how is she how is it like Amazing. studying with her she's a role model yeah a great mentor she's fantastic you know she she accepted my style it's very different from her music so she was very supportive of my you know more lyrical very tonal music but she also wanted me to reach deeper into my roots so she was always supporting my idea of working with folk material folk russian music and mm -hmm. stuff like yeah. that so for one of the classes that she was teaching it was a contemporary you know 20th century music analysis and performance seminar so she asked me to compose a piece for that class i was one of the few composers there other musicians were singers and instrumentalists so she asked me to compose for this piece and she said uh, for this class and she said uh, use the folk sound and i I wrote a piece that's kind of out there. It's still my music, but uh, I see the influence of Tanya Leon there, you know? It's crazier. And uh, maybe we can play a little bit of that piece. <laughs> Yeah, it was wonderful to study with her. She also did so much for my career. She, she recommended me for some big fellowships like the Charles Ives. Mm -hmm. She was the one who kind of you know, put my candidacy up front and I got the fellowship. Uh, it was a scholarship, not the fellowship. But I really needed the money at the time, especially, you know, and to be there at the academy, it was a big confidence booster for me, for sure. Did you have the scholarship or the fellowship? The scholarship. Yeah, I think that one is like, what, 5,000? More than that. I is it more now? 700. 7,500? Yeah, 75. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah so it's that, good money. So the people that don't know what we're talking about, the Charles Ives, it's part of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, yeah. and they give out these prizes mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. They give a lot of prizes out to composers, yes. right? So they give out, like, I would say, like, around 20 of these things, yeah. right? Yeah. And they range from, I think on the low end, it's 5,000, 7,500. Mm -hmm. On the high end, I mean, the high end is not that much more. It's like 15,000. Mm -hmm. Do you know if they give out anything more than that? For Big established artists, I think it's more than that. But more it's than kind that. of a live achievement. Oh, but awards. that's like one person, yeah. like one off. Yeah. yeah, but the majority are like between mm -hmm. that 7,500, 15,000 yeah. 15, range. So it's, I mean, it's a sizable yeah. amount in yeah. one shot. But also um, it's the support of the, you know, wonderful, beautiful establishment. And you, when you walk into those, you feel great because it's a yeah. beautiful building, you know, you're surrounded by established, um, beautiful artists. It feels great. Yeah, and it's like in, um, it's somewhere in, I don't remember if where it was. It's in Manhattan, yes, but I don't know. Upper, I can't remember uh, where, in the Upper West Side. Yeah, uh, 154th Street and Broadway. Way up there. Yeah. So I don't yeah. remember. It was yeah. a while ago. Mm -hmm, but yeah. uh, no, I remember it was fun and lots of people coming and going and, and like hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. 
and it was kind of overwhelming. Yeah. But I remember being very happy to get the money. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's how I am. Yeah, that's how I think yeah. because like I kind of grew up from a none of my family are music are musicians. Mm. Their mind is on the money a Do lot of the times. Do they ask you like, yeah. oh, like, oh, what's your real job? <laughs> Oh, I get the, that all the time. Oh, they know I don't have a real job. Well, they know that I teach. I teach uh, Columbia, mm -hmm. but it's only a couple times a week that mm -hmm. they would consider that my mm -hmm. real job. What about you? Yeah, every time I visit my hometown and I say take a taxi, you know, to go from one relative to another, and the taxi driver is asking me what do I do, and I say I'm a music teacher. <laughs> I teach kids. You it's, know, because if I say I'm a composer, they will not understand, probably. You know, I was at the dermatologist this morning, yeah. and it said occupation. I actually wrote teacher. Teacher. Yeah. Easier to explain. I didn't write composer. Yeah. I didn't write whatever this is, YouTuber, yeah, podcaster. <laughs> no, I, put it, I, don't, I don't tell anybody content, I do this thing. Content creator. Oh, that's even worse. I can't stand <laughs> that. Yeah. It's the yeah. Cre um, creative economy. What, there's a term for it. Creative economy. Creative economy, yeah. content, creator, content creator, it's all a bunch of baloney. Mm -hmm. But I would prefer being called a composer because yeah, that's, that's how I identify mm -hmm. as. And I know that you do too. Oh, absolutely. For you, I mean, I, I wanted to have you on for a couple of reasons. First, I, I knew of you for mm -hmm. a while. And yeah. the second thing is that your aesthetic is just so different than what I'm used to having mm -hmm. on. And I think it's really important to make sure that I represent as many voices as mm -hmm. possible. Like this is a possible voice that somebody can have mm -hmm. working today. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, like, how how did that all start for you to kind of write the way that you're writing and mm -hmm. uh, like and where that's leading right now? So I started off as a violinist, so I was very serious about my violin studies, you know, and growing up I played very tonal music, so I think this is a big influence on my life, you know, what uh, what I was playing, what I was listening to, it was more, you know, Western classical tonal music, uh, and only later in my life I, I discovered Schnittke, you know, more interesting, more atonal polytonal. So I think that's the, the, the big thing because, you know, as a violinist, I tend to, I gravitate towards lyrical, melodic stuff. I don't know how to explain. I mean, every note that I write, you know, I really hear it like that. So it's, I'm not trying to be someone. It's it's really how I hear things, how I hear the world world, in a more tonal way. I had these conversations with my teachers, you know, some, some of them said that maybe it's not relevant, you know, what I'm doing anymore. But I stick to my guns. So I keep writing this post-minimal music all, all almost and I like it the musicians seem to like it the audience seem to like it so I think it's okay it's going okay yeah of me. course it's okay because you're <laughs> you're doing it and you want to do yeah. it and no one's telling you to do it I mean this right. is the whole point this is, this is how I hear yeah, yeah. so I want to I want to actually play a couple minutes mm -hmm. of this so this is I think a good one to play first is this excerpt from the trio mm -hmm. so this is the uh, songs for Tasia mm -hmm. and I'm playing the last couple minutes of this piece
I like this piece a lot because you can really hear, the, first of all, you hear the three voices really well. And then at the end of the excerpt, there's this really beautiful cello counter melody that happens. Mm -hmm. And you don't really get that as often, I mean, in a new contemporary music to have not just one melody, but two melodies mm -hmm. going on. Who would have mm -hmm. thought, you know, two mm -hmm. melodies could happen at yeah. one time <laughs> and that you can actually hear the argument. So like with this piece, is it like when you're approaching something like this, how are you, how are you saying, okay, how am I going to write a piano trio that is going to be in your voice, and, but not quite like a Beethoven trio? Mm -hmm. I mean, or a Brahms trio that you're standing mm -hmm. on the shoulders question, of. Because it's such a big responsibility when you're writing for a standard ensemble like that. Of course, you know, the existing rep just weighs on you, especially coming from a background of a performer. Myself, I played many trios. So I approached this piece. First of all, the story of this piece is interesting. It's dedicated to the actual girl, Tasia Lariona, who was fighting rare genetic disease. And it was a flash mob on the internet. So musicians all over the world decided to come together and dedicate posts on Instagram to this girl, you know, so to raise awareness and raise funds. The treatment was $2 million. So, and we were able to raise it. Believe it or not, really? through, through the art. I was approached by this musicologist and she said, can you make a post, dedicate one of the posts to Tasia? And I told myself, it's not good enough. I'm going to write a piece. So it's just, you know, from it came from this place of a deep empathy to this poor child fighting this awful disease, spinal muscular atrophy. And she's, you know, from my country and I contacted the family. I brought them, you know, they were invited to be interviewed in New York uh, online, kind of raised awareness big time. So uh, the piece was very, you know, emotional for me. I didn't think about the sound of the piece. I just wanted to kind of convey what I was feeling. And I wrote this piece very fast. Usually I'm a slow writer, so it takes me months to write a piece. But this one I wrote in one week. So just kind of... Yeah, this was in I, one week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was so affected by the story, just the injustice sometimes that happens to people, and to children especially. So I guess it's all about how I felt about the situation. So the melodies just, just poured out of me. And I love contrapoint in general. I, I, I tend to write contrapuntally. You wouldn't expect it, you know, from like a post-romantic composer such, such as myself. But this is my training. You know, I was trained uh, by people, old Soviet school. Mm -hmm. Contrapoint is a thing for us. Well, I mean, you you also labeling yourself. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even label you as such because I hear minimalistic influences sure. as well and mm -hmm. things like that so i i always i'm careful to label yeah it's, uh, it's hard to composers you know definitely that idea of the, the counter melody it stuck out to me just i just don't hear it you know yeah. i mean it sounds so yeah. simple but it's mm -hmm. like well if i'm not hearing it every day then i mm -hmm. hear it all of a yeah. sudden like but it's gonna stick out I, I was trained you know my teacher was always kind of encouraging me to hear music linearly not just like this uh, you know clash of sounds so i i hear linearly so it's mm -hmm. easier for me to write contrapoint so what what is the big difference then because you you studied in Russia, right? Mm -hmm. Before Moscow the in Moscow Conservatory, mm -hmm. the Tchaikovsky Conservatory, mm -hmm. right? And then you did your your uh, master's study at, uh, Yale. at Yale. Mm -hmm. So what's the big difference then? Because that that's going to be, a, mm -hmm. a, I'm assuming, a huge change. I would say the difference is in in, in mentality, in mentality uh, towards students. So in Moscow, you are no one, like, and you are just under your teacher, you know, and you have to be, you know, kind of. Thank you, thank you, master. This kind of mentality. As a violinist, uh, both or as, as a composer. composer like and you, were you doing both? I was. I was uh, still a violinist, yeah. taking composition lessons on the side. No one knew about it, but studying with a professor of Moscow Conservatory, Konstantin Batashov, great, like one of the last big Soviet composers. I was already, you know, my heart was in composition. It's just I was technically still a violinist. But I would say it's universal, and you, of course, you know, probably will. I'll get a lot of <laughs> criticism for saying that, but this is true. In I think. In my, in my experience. Uh, so the mentality is that when you're a student, you're no one. So you have to be like, follow, you have to follow the advice of your teacher closely. I had this inner voice and first of all, the desire to be a composer. I'm from a small town, so it's not a thing in my hometown. No one knows what a composer is, let alone, uh, you know, being a female composer. So, but I just had that desire. I, I knew that I was a composer, so I needed to find a teacher. So I went in and I searched and I found this amazing composer. Uh, and he took me under his wing. You know, he didn't think much of me, you know, to be honest, but he was just happy to have someone to talk to, I think, <laughs> because he had a lot of ideas always. So I was this, um, but anyways, so I came to Yale and I heard that my music actually had some value. That was a big mentality shift for me. I so you didn't realize that until you went to Yale? Mm -mm. No, that is I, crazy. But I, I still wanted to compose. See, it wasn't. Uh, yeah. I wasn't composing to be complimented on my music. I just wanted to learn this, the craft, the technique. And at Yale, I heard com compliments about my music. And usually in in Moscow Conservatory, if your teacher is saying that 
it's good, it means that you're so bad, you're hopeless, like there's no hope. <laughs> so when I heard it, I was like, okay, I'm done. I think there's no hope for me anymore. Oh my God. But you know, it's just different mentality. But uh, technical things, it's less hands-on, you know, so you have more freedom, at least at Yale. Uh, I, I'm sure it's different for every teacher everywhere. But at Yale, the faculty members embrace your style. No questions asked, it's asked you know, so there's no pushing pull in terms of like, I came in and I was writing this music, tonal, you know, romantic. And uh, all of the faculty members are very supportive of that. They just want you to get really good at what you're doing. So mm -hmm. they didn't want to change. Lots of opportunities for composers at Yale, you know, so many concerts eight concerts a year that you can put your music Is it in. that many? Wow. At least, you know, when yeah. I was there, I, I tried to write for every single concert, almost every month. I, I'm not sure how, how it is now, but a lot, you know. In Moscow, zero. Like, you have to really fight for your music to be played. So some people, for five years, they don't have any performances. And at the fifth year, you know, at the end of your master's, uh, master's is five years, you have to produce an orchestral piece and it would be played. But if you don't have the experience of working with musicians, you know, so for some of them, it's overwhelming. So it was a regular thing in Moscow to not have regular performances yeah. and then all of a sudden pop out yep. an orchestra piece. Mm -hmm. Really, and the, the, and the professors thought that was, that was fine. Yeah. And what were the professors doing in the meantime? Did they have performances of their work? Uh, I mean, were they, were they being played some in Russia them. or overseas? Some of or? them. Some of them, we had some quite famous musicians, Vladimir Tarnapolsky, for instance, you know, new complexity composer, very well respected in, uh, in Europe. But some of the faculty members at Moscow Conservatory, they are like this. All of their career was in the past during the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. you know? So for like 30 something years, their music wasn't played at all. And uh, they always referred to themselves as, you know, the big thing. And I didn't uh, like, have a desire to question, is it played now? No, most of their music wasn't played for the last 30 something years. And meanwhile, they were like, you know, thought it was okay to teach their students yeah. to become composers. Yeah. 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 And this is a kind of common, I don't think it's, it's I don't think that is mm -hmm. as common mm -hmm. in the US. I think composers, faculty, generally speaking, mm -hmm. uh, I, I haven't met, uh, it's, it's in the very small minority mm -hmm. where the faculty at these institutions that don't have performances. Yeah. I think here at, in the States, they're pretty good about making sure they have their careers. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. like you want to look up to the, I mean, they're not just your teachers. They're in, in, in a lot of ways. And I don't know if they realize this mm -hmm. either. They're, mm -hmm. they're your role models, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah, at Yale, everyone, every single faculty member is a major American composer. Having performances, you know, Christopher Tiffanidis. Of course, yeah. Uh, R.J. Kernis, Martin mm -hmm. Bresnik, mm -hmm. uh, David Lang. You know, legends, mm -hmm. living legends. They are adored by, you know, orchestras, chamber ensembles. Their music is played all the time. So, yeah, this is a big change as well. You know, in Moscow, it wasn't the case. At least in my, my teacher's music wasn't played for... Uh, it's a great music. It's just uh, his character was so difficult. He was difficult to work with. <laughs> he yeah. didn't want to ask anyone. The times had changed so much for him during the Soviet Union, of course. There was a system, you know, if you went um, to Moscow Concerter, you were guaranteed a certain amount of performances. And if you're a member of the Union of Composers, of United of um, USSR, there was this big kind of system that was worked out. So it was all done for him. He didn't have to work at all. So after, I mean, this is something I have no, I've never mm -hmm. heard of any of this stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, so after the Soviet Union collapsed, all these kind of like artistic, like the web it's, of the, the artistic so network now. kind so, of ch you know, completely changed too. Have to find the opportunities, mm -hmm. and the older generation just didn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so performances just stopped, unless they were incredible composers, you know, and the musicians would just continue playing their works. Uh, we have such composer, he's no longer uh, living, Georgi Sviridov. So he came, he became this, you know, fixation, like his music is played all the time because it's very approachable, yet it's new music, it's 20th century piece, pieces, mm -hmm. you know, so his music is in uh, rap. So people know him. Wow. No, I mean, this is stuff I never mm -hmm. would have learned yeah. about at all. But I mean, I'm glad that you're here now. So mm -hmm. like, I mean, you, you went to Yale. And so at Yale, the eight mm -hmm. concerts, were there any, I know they do the, also the orchestra, mm -hmm. the orchestra reading, for example, yes, in and Moscow, it's mm -hmm. at the end of the term. Mm -hmm. But at Yale, I think the, you're only doing masters. So it's only at a couple of years. Yes. Uh, so did you get a chance to, to do the orchestra? Okay. Okay. It was my big chance that I think. I didn't blew it. I think my piece was actually successful and that piece still is played a lot. It's winter bells for orchestra. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. major orchestra students then played it and keep programming it. 
and I they just keep finding the piece. It's like you know, this. So I have more scared. pieces now, but this is the most played piece of mine. So it was at the uh, end of my master's degree. So during the second year, you are granted this opportunity to write for an orchestra, and the uh, Yale School of Music Orchestra is top-notch musicians. So you can write very difficult stuff for them, and they'll play it beautifully. And they actually rehearse, not like one and a half times, but they would spend you know, three weeks rehearsing it. Two, oh, they spent times. that long? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I want to play actually a couple minutes of, not Winter Bells, you can find mm -hmm. Winter Bells, you can just YouTube it, yeah. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can find that if you'd like on your own, but I want to play a couple minutes of a more recent piece mm -hmm. called Phoenix. Yale, so I guess it's going to be a big change for you to go from Moscow to Yale and then like all of a sudden have an orchestra performance yeah. three weeks. I've never heard of three weeks. I, I, I had two days, mm -hmm. you know. How's it at Juilliard? So for the orchestral pieces, the orchestra play? Uh, yeah, they composers? had readings too. Yeah, we did. Um, but it's a reading or it's actually a performance? So at Juilliard, they have orchestral readings too. I can't remember how many, mm -hmm. but I know they do at least one a semester and they do quite a good job actually they give you quite a good amount of time not three weeks mm -hmm. but enough time mm -hmm. and then they also do one big concert at the end of the year where they'd have like a contest so you submit your piece mm -hmm. and so it's not everyone who gets to play no fund. no and i did one reading actually and then i never did a concert mm -hmm. But part of the reason I never did a concert is because I was, at that time, I was I was submitting my orchestra pieces to all these reading mm -hmm. workshops, mm -hmm. and I was getting a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the professors basically said, like, like if you get a, re a professional you reading, you're not going to be on mm -hmm. the school concert, which is the, fair. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. that's fine. You did the Minnesota Orchestra Composer Institute, Yeah, right? that was at that time, yeah. 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 Did fast? you do that too? Yeah. How was that? Amazing. For me, fantastic, because there were, then the Minnesota Orchestra kept programming this piece. For years to come. Which piece was it? Was Winter it the Bells. same? Oh, it was the same yeah. piece, Winter mm -hmm. Bells. Okay. And you saw it and uh, audience really liked it. I think oh, yeah? It's the winter kind of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Osmo Vanska conducted, Hanu Lindu conducted it, uh, Sarah Hicks conducted it, many different conductors mm -hmm. in that orchestra. And the first conductor was Osmo Vanska. Uh, yes, but it was already, I've done this piece at Yale first. That was my big piece for the at, the at the end of my master's degree. And I had a really good recording of it by a fantastic young conductor, Farhat Khudiv, who was my classmate. He is incredible. You know, his career is just blossoming right now. So he did a, a fantastic job on that piece. He put a lot of emotion in it. So that's my kind of best recording to this day from that concert. I've submitted that recording and the score, and I think that's how I got in into the Composers Institute. The so uh, was, yeah. Yeah, it was not a professional premiere, you know, so it was considered a student performance. But the of the level, the, the high level of performance was just very impressive. 
No, absolutely. I mean, I like, I mean, I'd really like for you to kind of describe like what it's like to participate in a reading program like this, because it's something that, you know, most mm -hmm. people don't, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to do, oh, especially yeah. when you're a younger composer, yes. especially the Minnesota Orchestra Institute, yes. which I think is yeah. probably, the probably the best, mm -hmm. if not one of the top yeah. few. Because you get to spend a week with them and actually rehearse the piece and workshop it to some degree. Of course, you can't rewrite it during your time there, but you can change quite a bit, you know. So I remember cutting some, you know, my orchestration tends to be very heavy. So actually I had, you know, Osma once suggested that I cut some things, you know, and dynamics. We worked with, a lot with dynamics, you know, just kind of shaping uh, phrases. And it wasn't written in, so he kind of penciled it in. It was great to get his feedback because he's such a phenomenal, phenomenal musician, one of the best conductors. So what of kind of time. things were he asking you to do specifically? Because that's very interesting. I've never seen a conductor kind of just start writing. This is what you should do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was grateful. He saw that I wanted that feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, I would do things like, you know, <laughs> two parallel lines of, of first and second oboe. And I would label them, you know, first oboe, mezzo forte, and the second one, mezzo piano, some, something stupid like that. And he's like, no. You should label them the same at the same dynamic level, hmm. and they will just adjust. Oh, and they will like adjust that, themselves. You know? Interesting. So I'm kind of a little bit overthinking. That usually I have, I don't have enough dynamics, but at some passages of that piece, I had that mindset. So he helped me with that. So what else? Uh, some things that were not playable, you know, have a, a tuba passage in a kind of a second octave, like. An, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was in a, it was in a high octave yeah. or and it wasn't possible to play it was it was just sounded okay. not idiomatic and i was doubling it with cello so i just crossed it out and it was fine and it was Better. fine at the end yeah i feel like sometimes we we as composers were like too precious with some of the material you know right. it's like we oh please this is my this is my yeah. music i can't of course it depends on where your focus is right so if your focus is on on the sound on the orchestration then yes every single decision decision that you're doing yeah. is important for you right no absolutely but also i this is something i learned while i was doing my the la phil thing is that you know it sounds like one way in your head but then when you're in a in a space the sound you can't really you honestly can't really predict Absolutely. how some things will blend mm -hmm. sometimes it's a good thing you know mm -hmm. but sometimes it's there's so much that's going on you have to kind of like uh, it's almost like throwing darts at, mm -hmm. a, at a at a pin board I mean you can't you can't throw all bullseyes you mm -hmm. know you have to like focus on the it's yeah. not a good analogy at all but you got to <laughs> focus on the important things mm -hmm. in those few minutes that you have yeah. you can't you can't do everything mm -hmm. so the conductor pointing these things out to you I mean that's mm -hmm. extremely helpful because right. it's you know, you can't keep it. You can't keep an ear out for yeah. every little thing. Absolutely. And in a normal, you know, situation with the professional orchestras, you can get only one rehearsal and address. That's what you get. And at the composers' readings, uh, such as Minnesota Composers Institute, you get one week of rehearsals. This is precious. This is, you know, so you can yeah. buy it with money. This is like priceless. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you start to count, like, oh, how much does it cost per hour to have all those musicians? Yeah, it kind of gets a little, yeah. it kind of gets a little, yeah. I don't recommend anybody do this because I did it before yeah. and yeah. it was kind of depressing mm -hmm. uh, to think about like how much potential yeah. wasted time that right. I could have by blabbing my mouth because right. I'm, I'm the type of person, mm -hmm. I don't know how you are, but mm -hmm. I just don't like uh, talking the, during rehearsal. Me too. Me too. I, I hope that my music you know, speaks, but sometimes the technical details, you know, the phrasing, that's what, for me, it gets interesting, you know, the, actually the shaping of the music. So with my style, you know, kind of traditionals, you know, if they were playing Brahms symphony, I do the similar kind of gestures and right. phrases, so we can talk about those things with them. And for me, this is interesting. And uh, each conductor comes in with his or her own vision. And for me, to see that is, is absolutely priceless. See, like for me, I'm, I'm like a little jealous of that, mm -hmm. you know, because like when I come up with the, especially for orchestra, it's like, it's like very hard to explain what the language is. Right. And it's like, I got to get past a barrier, mm -hmm. you know, like it's not even, we can't, we don't even make music for like the first half mm -hmm. hour, I would say mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. It's just like barely can we get the notes and rhythms, you know? Yeah. So there's something about like, speaking the orchestral player's language mm -hmm. i think that's it, it is important too in a way as long as that's what you want to do yeah you know? yeah that's you know? within my aesthetics it's how it's working but of course you know there are situations where you disagree with the conductor big time on tempos or on, on phrasing and what do you do then right so it's especially with bigger orchestras you have to be like okay this is that that's not how i heard it and we don't have enough time to fix it but this is it you know let it be yeah. kind of 
And then only I had actually funny stories of my friends at Yale, you know, Jordan Casper, my wonderful, wonderful composer, great friend. When I just came to Yale, I didn't know how to work with orchestras at all. I never had this experience as a, as a composer. I played in the orchestra, but we never worked with living composers. So I, just, this concept was just not in my head. So I remember <laughs> during the first rehearsal, it was a piece for soprano and, and big string orchestra, huge. I started kind of running around and trying to fix and talk to each player individually. And the conductor was standing there like, what Ooh. is she doing? <laughs> so my friend Jordan, he's like, this is not how you work with musicians. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> it was funny. Big learning experience for me. I used to do that a lot too. Yeah. yeah. But I, I don't do that anymore. Yeah. But I know people, I know composers that still do, mm. not that drastically, <laughs> but they still kind of go up on stage during yeah. the break and start. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, some musicians, they would come to you right. also. Like I it's had a, different, right? It's yeah. When you're asked a question, this you can answer. But. So you do all this orchestral stuff. We talked about some of the chamber stuff. I'm, I'm curious because I don't do this stuff really. Mm -hmm. I used to do it a little bit, but you do a lot of stuff with dance, mm -hmm. specifically ballet. Yeah. Right. So I want to play you play a couple minutes of this before we start talking about mm -hmm. it. So this is from uh, Nostalgia. This is like four minutes into the piece. Mm -hmm. And I have all the pieces down in the description below, by the way, if anybody wants to hear the full mm -hmm. piece. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Uh, I got an email from this choreographer, Pascal Rieu, big shot, beautiful choreographer from France. He said that RJ Kurnis had recommended my name for this project. He needed a contemporary Russian composer for his program. So because the, uh, there were three pieces, uh, two by, you know, established Russian composers, Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky, and he needed to kind of showcase the 21st century Russian composer. And uh, RJ Kurnis recommended my name because... Pascal and Aaron uh, worked together before. Uh, so I, I'm reading this email and I can't believe my eyes because I've been wanting to compose for ballet for a long time, which I'd never had the opportunity. I replied within probably 15 minutes or so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and he disappeared for six months. And then I'm like, did I dream this? This never happened, probably. <laughs> I just like it came, the vision came to my mind. And... But then he reappeared, he was busy, you know, doing touring and friends things like that. And then we started working and uh, this was my first piece and now it's 2023. I have my seventh ballet. My God. <laughs> so the genre so kind even of during COVID, me. the, the mm -hmm. ballet stuff was still yes, happening. happening yeah. I had the privilege to work with the San Francisco Ballet last season and it's a major American ballet company, you know, with smaller companies. I also worked with Bashoi Theater back in Moscow. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So very lucky. Uh, and the genre kind of found me, I think, 
this is probably the best combination of my music is you know what it is and uh, dance contemporary dance there's this um, especially with more abstract works there's this kind of tension that happens but also it's a synergy that happens within you know the my music and the dance especially with great choreographers i think this is just like uh, my dream is to write something big you know so that that first project you did yeah. right the, with nostalgia, nostalgia. Mm -hmm. the stravinsky and the Tchaikovsky, mm -hmm. what pieces were those? So orchestral seats of Tchaikovsky uh, and then uh, Lenosis by Lenosis. Lenosis. Yeah. okay. And that piece sounds, I mean, that's a very yes. kind of off-the-wall piece, mm -hmm. even for Stravinsky. Yeah. And then you had your piece mm -hmm. kind of, and your piece, I wonder, was it like on the, it was on the whole program? Yes, so and all it was three the last of those, one. And it was the last mm -hmm. one, so they had to stick around to hear it yeah. at the very end. All three of those choreographies were completely by the same person? Yes, okay. And, and the same dancers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just like a complete idiot yes, when it comes to dance. Evening, That's why I'm asking these yeah, questions. Yeah, in one evening you can imagine the toll, the physical toll, the mental toll on mm -hmm. the dancers. You know, we, as musicians, we work a lot, we think, and it's true, especially, you know, thinking and practicing, but dancers, dancers work so much harder just physically. Yeah, th that's they're why I was asking. Yeah. They're doing the whole mm -hmm. show. Yep. Yeah. I have endless respect. For, for dancers and for musicians, of course, as well. But so seeing the amount of work physical and sometimes several shows a day, two, two a day, so three pieces during the day, matinee, and then in, in, in the evening, one more time. And they would do it, this is a regular thing, performing twice. Yep. And like when you're approaching, uh, so of course they approached mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then when you're doing the, the show, I mean, are you coming up with the music first? Are they coming up with the dance first? Like, how does that, like, how did you even know what to do if you yes, never did it before? I know, right? It's a good question. Pascal, it was interesting because he wanted for me to reach out deep into my, you know, roots and stuff. He was interested in the nostalgia feeling, you know, and this is kind of my, he, he kind of guessed it, you know, because this is, this feeling is uh, the primary emotion that I feel, you know, I'm just a very sentimental person and being nostalgic is kind of my second nature. <laughs> and of course, you know, coming from, you know, leaving everything behind, you know, migrating to the United States at a relatively young age. So all of that was easy to access in, you know, kind of he said, just remember yourself as a little girl and we'll go from there. You know, I, I brought some material with those thoughts in mind and I started playing it for him. So we would meet every two weeks in New York. So it was a very hands-on process oh, wow. for him. So he goes from music. But sometimes he would ask me to extend this section. So he actually, uh, he has uh, an, this innate uh, sense of form. So he was asking me sometimes to ex expand or make something shorter. Mm -hmm. I had a com I had to compose one time during the rehearsal. Actually, it's uh, one of those 16-note passages. He just needed more, like 16 measures more. And I had to come up with it right there in front of the dancers. I had my computer with Finale. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> and you had to print out everything. And, uh, yeah, they had to, and yeah. all the musicians were kind of sitting there. And time is Actually, ticking. it was still without the musicians. So just me at the piano and plus my computer with MIDI. Still? Mm -hmm. yeah, it was like I felt pressure <laughs> because everyone was watching. But he just needed the to continue you know this phrase to continue so when you establish a certain texture you can prolong it you know if given a certain style of course so for me it wasn't that difficult it's just that's not how i compose i don't compose in front of people no i don't know anyone that does <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah so, i mean you see my setup i yeah. mean i'm just hanging yeah, around here yourself. you know yeah, hoping I... something happens but then mm -hmm. you got people in front of you like and dozens of people like looking at you for them it's something different you know <laughs> well because the dancers they're used to having like repertoire to to yep. to play again or even would they do anything that's not orchestral even like just have uh, electronic music or not with this choreographer he usually picks you know he actually commissions works from modern living composers but he usually does you know standard rep Tchaikovsky mm -hmm. and, you know, Mahler, he did a beautiful piece, Mahler, and things like that, you know, established rap that wasn't written for ballet usually. Mm -hmm. So he repurposes orchestral music for mm -hmm. ballet in a very beautiful, interesting way. So like, I'm, I'm wondering now, because he did seven ballets in a row, is it, does it get, does it get tiring to do, or, or is it like, no, this is like, this for, is like what I wanted yeah. to do, like I figured it out. Because I, I know some people mm -hmm. like that are mm -hmm. with opera, you know, they start doing opera yeah. and then all of a sudden they're mm -hmm. like, oh my God, mm -hmm. this was what I was supposed mm -hmm. to do, you know, but you, you don't start doing opera mm -hmm. when you're starting out, you right. just start doing, you know, chamber pieces and... I'm lucky because I have some other pieces as well. So I think if I was only doing ballet, maybe it would be, you know, tiring after a while. I don't see it yet, but 
you know, if I'll do like 50 pieces in a row, maybe I will be like, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. But I have chamber music, orchestral things, operas. So I am doing lots of different things at the same time, almost like, you know, I work at the, at the piece uh, kind of on its own, but then I would take a break for, for a week to something else. So it feels fresh when I come back to it. And plus different choreographers, different process. Yeah. You know, but uh, I would say some universal things like we have to be as composers very mindful of tempo and counts because dancers, they count. So they sometimes it's they're so involved in the choreography, they are just counting. So they are not listening to the music per se. So it's, you know, mixed meter is a little bit sometimes hard because I love mixed meter and for them, they need to kind of group it. So it still makes, you know, groups of six or groups of eight. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter what, what is going on in your music, but they're counting in more or less equal equilibriums like that. And they don't care about saying notation or anything. Like oh, your choreographer, he no. doesn't want to see any of that. He Mm-mm. just wants to know what it sounds listen, like. Yeah. Right. Pascal used to listen a lot. Like He really would like just you know, in, in his headphones before rehearsals. And uh, Some choreographers are more kind of self-absorbed. You know, they are more interested in the choreography and sometimes they work with a metronome. And then you kind of throw something on top of that, you know, it's not the best. The best is when the choreographer is really listening to your music or you're composing together, as you know, as with Pascal, it's really hands on. I mean, when you're when you're saying that they're listening to them, I'm just trying to get the process mm-hmm. down. When you're when you're saying that they're listening to your music, what are they actually listening to? Because you're still in the process of mm-hmm. writing it, right? Sure, but the emotional content, you know, some imagery, tempo, of course, the structure. But is it like the MIDI, uh, like the computer mock-up, I, or are you playing on the piano? I usually, or? I usually provide demos. I don't like MIDIs, they sound awful. I usually play all of the instruments myself, oh, okay. and I uh, have a best friend, Konstantin Sukavetsky, a phenomenal pianist, I ask him to play. And um, we've been creative, collaborative partners for, for so many years. He's usually involved in the playing anyways. So I would send him, you know, eight pages of piano part and he would play it for me, record it, and then I would layer other instruments, you know, still play very actively on viola violin. So I would do that. So they would, he would get like a real, like mm-hmm. a most realistic recording yes. possible. Yeah. So yeah. even if it's a full orchestra, mm-hmm. you know, they get, he gets piano, he gets violin, yeah. he gets at least some. Mm-hmm. It's his, important to provide the, the demos. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm because I, I I did a dance thing a long time ago mm-hmm. uh, while I was at Juilliard, and it was it was a lot of fun, but mm-hmm. it was a lot of work. I was surprised how much work it was. Yeah. It was a lot of like showing up, mm-hmm. like going yeah. to rehearsals. Right. Did uh, you like the process of being there and seeing? The I dance? liked it, but I liked it, but I couldn't see a uh, future is a strong word, mm-hmm. but I couldn't see like what where would my music go after this? Mm-hmm. You know, like I couldn't. My problem with the whole process was. I, I like the process itself. I just don't know how my, my own voice will develop with it. Like, will mm-hmm. my voice be too, like, influenced by mm-hmm. by this, like, extrinsic mm-hmm. thing? Or should mm-hmm. I allow myself mm-hmm. to figure out what I'm doing more? Mm-hmm. But maybe that was just me being too much in my head, mm-hmm. you know? But I, I mean, for your music, I think it enhances it. Because, like, I, like, when I was listening to all your excerpts before today, it was the ballet that I felt that was most contrasting. Mm-hmm. Versus yeah, the other pieces, right. which you could, they could, you can really tell they were by you. But when I heard the ballet, um, yeah, I can, obviously I can still hear that it's you. But you were doing a lot of different things, mm-hmm. especially with tempo, mm-hmm. motion. You were you were changing um, uh, formally. It was changing mm-hmm. a lot quicker, I mm-hmm. thought, mm-hmm. Uh, rather than these like kind of big arcs. Mm-hmm. It didn't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't uh, uh, like that in mm-hmm. the ballet. So I thought for you, it, it made sense. Which for me. Mm-hmm. Like when I was doing my dance thing, it was just kind of like this big drone, <laughs> like throughout the whole thing. I didn't really, I was like too scared to do anything right. because I, I was just staring at the dancers the mm-hmm. whole time. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't need to do anything mm-hmm. else because they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. But for dance, it's good to have those changes. You know, it's mm-hmm. interesting that you mentioned that because I had, I have this like, for me, you know, I'm working on my inner weaknesses and I, one of the weaknesses that I think in my form is that I tend to change, you know, like tableau writing. So there's that and then there's something else and there's something else. So for ballet, it's perfect. And this is what I gravitate so naturally. And I, I want to, you know, in Phoenix for, for orchestra, it's that long kind of drawn out Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's yeah. what my, I'm going to do it, you know. So it's maybe not the most organic just yet, but this is what I'm trying to work out as, a, as, a, as an artist, you know. I think. But it, I think the trio does that too. Yeah. I think the trio that we played 
you mm-hmm. listen to the whole yeah. thing, it has this kind of big thing. And mm-hmm. I love this, by the way. I, I, I did it in my last piece, this, mm-hmm. this thing. This I just, nice. I don't care how cliche it might be. It's hard to do. Mm-hmm. It is not it's easy to make a big line. Because, yeah. like, people are list, are used to these, like, you know, 30-second yeah. things. Or... So, in winter balls, it's, it's tableau writing. It's very, it's like a ballet. Mm-hmm. Different, you know, somehow working. But it's such an old piece at this point, you know. I uh, I'm not thrilled about the form of that piece. I think there's some good things in it, good material, but the form sucks big time. So I'm like, stop programming it. <laughs> and then people still program it. So thank you. Orchestras keep doing it. <laughs> but I have better pieces, I think. So when you're like, like, like for example, like I, I personally don't have pieces that get played like that like yeah. all the time. I would say that there's, it's kind of random, at least for me. But for you, you have this piece that kind of gets, so you, I'm like wondering, like, so you're saying you don't, you get kind of annoyed that they don't, is it that you want them to play a newer piece or do you think it's i have other pieces at this yeah. point you know so why do they keep going to this back one of course i i feel guilty of you know complaining because it's a good problem to have right yeah Just whatever i would say right? so yeah <laughs> but I, uh, phoenix is a lucky one as well so it's played a lot uh, but i also have my symphony symphony number one so it's, it's a harder piece to play so it's played less and longer a much longer 35 minutes long yeah but i had a few spectacular performances of that one as well so i'm lucky with the composer. i mean what, i mean like for you would it be a situation where i mean like for example if you if you're approached by an orchestra would you rather have them play something that i don't know is rarely performed mm-hmm. or would you rather write something new something new for yeah sure. is there something you feel like you haven't written yet because you wrote a lot for orchestra i just want to keep working on my orchestration and the form and everything and the orchestra is such a perfect medium to do all of those things that I like. It's just hard to write something that's if it's not commissioned and you're busy doing other projects, it's hard to find the time, the motivation and, you know, the strength to do an orchestral piece if it's not commissioned. Yeah, and the older we're so, getting too, it's mm-hmm. like you have other responsibilities oh, yeah. and, but, you know, it's it's hard to just keep doing it for as a, as a hobby because mm-hmm. I, I hate to say it, but that's, if it's not something paid, especially mm-hmm. by the time we're our age, right. it's it's a hobby. Mm-hmm. For you know, under the IRS, at least they call it a hobby. Yeah, at least when I talked to my accountant, that's what he told yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I'm and not yeah, kidding. That, yeah, and that this is something that we live for, right? It's ironic. Yeah. Yeah, I have to teach a lot, you know, to make uh, ends meet, and I'm also lucky. I'm relatively lucky, you know, financially. I, I married well, <laughs> so it's all good. But uh, I can't live without composition. No, that's I'm the my same. Whole yeah, life, of course, right? yeah. And, do you feel it's a little bit like condescending almost to, to call it a hobby or you get a kick out of it? So it's like... I'm mm-hmm. the type of... Per- I mean, I've said this before. I'm mm-hmm. the type of person I don't get too too upset and mm-hmm. I, don't do- I also don't get too, too excited, excited mm-hmm. you know? So for me, the word hobby, it's if that's just a term. It's mm-hmm. just like we were talking about labels before. Right. You know, just a label. If it's mm-hmm. a hobby, it's a big deal. If it's a hobby, there are mm-hmm. people that play golf. There are people that... Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I wouldn't equate doing composition to playing golf. I think it's a lot... Uh, sorry for all the golfers out there but you know i've played golf before mm. P- composing is a much deeper mm-hmm. activity than mm-hmm. than than playing like golf or something or or doing like a sport or well mm-hmm. a sport is different because you're it's a group activity right so you're getting other things out of it than just hitting mm-hmm. a ball but what we do is something that we can keep doing for the rest of our lives that's mm-hmm. the other thing right that's kind of an inner calling yeah and uh like my teacher georg haas at columbia he would always say like you know it's a a spiritual place Mm -hmm. you know that's it's and when you listen to the music it sounds that way too Mm -hmm. so i mean that's the way i view it so the i i just kind of laugh it off it's Mm -hmm. like the pieces that are not being paid or the time that i'm spending not getting paid yeah whatever it's a hobby you know it is it is but all of it is composing so even when i'm getting paid whether i'm getting paid not getting paid it's all it's all under the same umbrella it's mm-hmm. all composing of course you know it's not mm-hmm. one is not more valuable to mm-hmm. me than the other in fact some people you know back in in my home country it's considered you know it's better if it's not paid so then it means that you're a true artist so that's the mentality and the in in your in home Moscow country, country. Yeah, that's where that, that's what they would say yeah, yeah. I think that's it's, a little it, too intense I know, but it's, yeah i'm not making this up it's shameful to charge for your music you have to compose you know, from inside and um, never charge anything. <laughs> I know it's strange, right? Yeah, it's it's what a, being a true artist is. It's just you can't live without composition and 
it's not for money. No, because like in the history of music, there are lots of examples of composers like, you know, talking about making money. Mm -hmm. Like in, even in my class at Columbia, we talk about Juscan and Dufay even all the way back then and how, mm -hmm. you know, Juscan would charge a lot more mm -hmm. for his pieces than Dufay. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the, like the wealthy Italian families that Juscan was working for, they would tell Just Campbell Dufay is charging this much, you know. Why do you want to charge that much? Yeah. Just can't go go to Dufay then, and then go to Dufay. Said no, no, sorry, we want to go work with you. So because he these, charges more, that means that he's better. <laughs> so I mean, this has been going on for yeah. forever, and then we we still remember Just Can mm -hmm. and Dufay all the same, you know, yeah. in our field at least. So mm -hmm. I think it's ridiculous that what you say, but you, I mean, you agree as well. So oh yeah, it's, but it's it's a it's a true mentality of a starving artist, you know, post Soviet era. Still, everyone's like, oh, don't talk about money. It's shameful. But see, that, that that's tough because like if you're if you don't have some kind of monetary baseline, right, and you have the mentality, right, that we both do, that we want to write for the next fifty years, of course, right. I mean, that has to be supported in some way, yeah, with the with the ups and the downs. Like right. your career, my mm -hmm. career, we're not. It's not going to be up the whole time. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some of course, downs. Of course, you know? of course. It, you know, you have to. You know, the mentality is that you have to hide your sources of income. And you are this artist that just writes because the soul wants it. That's true, though, and it's sad actually too. That that's <laughs> yeah, what but we that's, have to do. I'm sure there are more countries like that with this mentality. I think it's not unique for post-Soviet Union people. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I'll get criticisms for this, but this is how I felt. This is from my own experience. Yeah, well, but it's the. I mean, it's your. It's the truth, or your truth, or mm -hmm. my truth. I mean, it doesn't really. You know, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, it doesn't really matter what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, but. <laughs> as long as you're being honest because there are people that are listening to this they they have no idea what the field is right. they don't and uh, mm -hmm. it's also difficult for us to get out there mm -hmm. as composers because uh, we're we're not uh, really asked to talk about how we feel outside of especially in school outside of school mm -hmm. you know we do our pre-concert talks mm -hmm. two minutes just about the piece mm -hmm. one piece it's not really enough context to what we really do. Yeah, no one is talking about it, and it's kind of a taboo subject almost. And you know, what it is to be a composer these days, and uh, how to find commissions, how to uh, find work, it's, do you want to talk about this, you know, how to find opportunities a little bit, because you had such a great career, and uh, sustaining for many years, for like 10 plus years, you had, you know, always commissions and all these yeah but it doesn't things. it doesn't equate to anything i would say like substantial especially compared to uh, friends of mine that graduated with me mm. in high school mm. like mm. i was very lucky to go to this very uh, good high school mm. where there like a lot of the kids ended up at berkeley and mm -hmm. uc berkeley harvard mm. uh, you know a lot of great places and they're all a lot of them are you know they're they're working in at hedge funds or they're right. working at you know biotech or mm -hmm. And, so financially, I mean, I mean, and fi you financially, mean financially speaking, they're making you know way mm -hmm. more than I am, like in the in the ballpark of four to five, six times. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure. I if you look on paper, my resume, yeah, it looks like very successful. But like I posted that video last year about how much money I made in 2022, mm -hmm. it was not very much compared to what you see mm -hmm. on the CV. Mm -hmm. So I think there is some some disconnect to. When you look at the percentage of like who are the top composers or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, or who are the people graduating from these top schools and the income level that they have, you know, yeah. there is a huge disconnect mm -hmm. compared to like other fields. Absolutely. No, I'm not I, saying we should I, be no, making 300 know, grand a year. Know, That's not what I'm saying at all, but at least something. It's the reality we live in, right? So, uh, and, but for us, livable. success the success means that our music is played by top tier orchestras right. like LA. <laughs> you, just had, right. you just had this amazing big premiere. Working with great collaborators, you know, famous yeah. choreographers, soloists. For us, success is this. It's not money per se, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to... So, you know, if many, it was that, I would have yeah. quit 10 years ago yeah, once I same, found out what was going here. on. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I, you know, sometimes just for... I'm laughing with my husband and we talk, you know, how many hours did you work today? And it's like 14, 12 sometimes more yeah i know <laughs> like how much are you making <laughs> nothing nothing in peanuts i work for food <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've done that before I, I started doing that and i don't know if have you ever done this before like you take a commission fee of and course. you divide by the number of hours you work oh. have you done it's that gonna before? Be negative <laughs> negative numbers <laughs> yeah i did it i did it for yeah. a couple of pieces so, yeah 
No, I, the, the num actually for one of the, I'm not going to say which piece it mm -hmm. was, but for one of the pieces, actually, it was only because I found the idea so quickly. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any period of like languish. Yeah, yeah. I was, I hit about $50 an hour. It's not bad. Yeah. That's not bad. Right. <laughs> right. I, I once, and I logged it in, mm -hmm. I had my Google calendar. Wow. I would start mm -hmm. at 10 AM or mm -hmm. whatever time mm -hmm. I put the, this X piece, you know, and whenever I'm done, it's like put in a Google 12 p.m. or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and the next day, whatever, same thing. And I just added it all. I didn't even count. I said, so, okay, let me just finish the piece, add it all up, figure out the number mm -hmm. of hours, divide, and, and don't look at it as it's going mm -hmm. and try mm -hmm. to finish it faster. Just mm -hmm. do it as you, mm -hmm. and it was like, and, and I did it and, uh, with that kind of hourly rate. I was like, mm -hmm. huh. But I wonder also, was I thinking, am I doing this, speak, am I doing this because like I know I'm counting the hours so I'm like actually working and not just mm -hmm. kind of sitting mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. but how many pieces you need to produce in order to, to you know sustain like a, a normal wage oh yeah but that's like, another question right you would have to do that right because like in this this area of the, of the U.S. Mm -hmm. just for people listening I mean you have to make $50 an hour uh, pretty much if you yeah. want like a comfortable yeah, yeah. I'm saying mm -hmm. comfortable not like rich but yeah. like Comfortable. comfortable you're not worrying about like take if you have kids you're not worrying about daycare you're not worrying about food on the table you're not worried about paying more mm -hmm. these kind of things saving a little bit for retirement i would say around that at least 40 to 60 at least yeah and with kids. this is assuming you are like finished with one piece mm -hmm. start on the next piece yeah, the and next you have day pieces lined up for the next few years yes and to produce like that i think it's for me it's impossible i need to take breaks yeah. Otherwise, my brain would just, uh, it will melt and I will see it coming, dripping from my nose. Oh, yeah. Since the LA thing, I, I, haven't, I haven't written, you know, I'm like starting to think so about much. now the next yeah, piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, well, I thank you for coming on. This was course. a lot of fun. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Great. Thank you.